it's a good thing that he booked that flight to Denver for after game seven, because you know, that's how traveling works. Run it back starts now. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it back. Run it up. Happy run Tuesday morning. Run yes. I remembered it was Tuesday, and that's really all I was shooting for today. So the day has been done. This is Run It Back on FanDuel TV. I would like to introduce my friends, my family. It's Sham Sharania, Stadium Insider, Chandler Parsons, Eddie Gonzalez. Guys, seems like we've been not talked to each other in about seven weeks. Um, and so much has happened since the last time we were all here, including Chandler making ridiculous predictions about a game seven. And it all happened. <laughs> and it happened last night. And the Heat dominated. I think most of us were asking for a game that was good. Didn't really get that. But we got a Miami Heat win, and it was a big one. Jimmy Butler, of course, MVP of the series, 28-7-6. Caleb Martin is about to get rich. And then there's Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. And we will talk about both of those young men because I don't think they're very happy this morning as well. But for the Heat, to blow a 3 nothing series lead almost... Uh, and then come back and win this thing in game seven on the road in Boston. How impressed were you, Chandler? Uh, super impressive. <laughs> Obviously, the whole world kind of felt the momentum shift to the Boston Celtics. And then I think Charles Barkley said once that they won game six, it kind of then goes back to Boston, right? Everyone thinks they're the better team. They're the higher seed. They had a better season. And now it's coming down on their home floor after everything that he's been through. And, uh, man, they showed up. And last night, I got to give credit to Caleb Martin. It's funny. Everyone keeps talking about how he's getting paid this summer. He's not a free agent. But if he were to be this summer, he's I, was with my, I was with my agent. <laughs> he's going to make close to $20 million a year. And that is insane. The fact of this kid, his story, what he's come from, undrafted, everything that he's done, how far he's developed. It's crazy that he showed up and played like he did in the playoffs. Um, but... This was this was the Boston Celtics first quarter last night was abysmal. You, you score 15 points, you shoot 26 percent from the field, 0 for 10 from the three, uh, turn the ball over four times, and meanwhile Jason Tatum sprains his ankle the first play of the game and takes one a shot a one shot attempt in the biggest game of of their season. Uh, it was brutal, and I didn't see this happening. Uh, but kudos to the Heat, man. They 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 fought back. Uh, everyone was counting them out. Uh, but this was super impressive and this was just a balance. This is what the heat do. I, I keep sleeping on them all year long. Um, and I'm gonna do it again and I'm sure we'll get there, but I'm gonna do it again in the finals. But th this was a really, really impressive win and, and they deserve to be going to the, to the finals. It's, it's felt like a little bit of a course correction. I mean, the Celtics were dead in the water in game three. We're all saying they quit. They look like a team who was ready for the off season. Even game six, they were a miracle away from going home then in Miami. So this, this is probably the team that should have won. This is probably the better team, whether we feel like they have more talent or not. The thing to remember about the Miami Heat, they were a shot away from the finals last year, essentially the same roster. They were the number one seed last year. Again, essentially the same roster. And this year, yes, they were plagued with injuries. They lost Tyler Hero immediately as the playoffs started. But this is a savvy roster this is a talented roster this is a roster that's won big games before and they're coached by probably the best coach in the league so it's not surprising that they're this good when it matters like this um i i, I think it's a little bit of a course correction because what we thought of them in the regular season and i said this last week about Jokic. i'm saying it today about jimmy butler probably the most accurate reason to have this uh eastern conference mvp uh, because somebody deserved to be awarded for the performances he had. I know we're all excited about Caleb Martin. Uh, he didn't even average 20 points a game this series. He had some pretty good games. He had a great game last night. But Jimmy Butler deserved this award. And uh, look, the Heat are back where they said they were going to be. And uh, I think it's an interesting series. I, I, I don't know if, if, if maybe we have been better off had the Celtics won. But with the effort they put up yesterday, they kind of told us what, what we would have got from them in a week as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, a, a, a few things really jumped out. At the end of the day, it's a make or miss league. And what I saw in the first half is that Joe Mazzula and the Celtics, they didn't really have an answer when the Heat went zone. I think that's the brilliance of Eric Spolstra. When he's able to switch things up, he didn't do anything in the lineup, but they went to the zone a little bit in the first half. And that kind of threw Boston off. And anytime you have Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, they went 13 for 36 from the field. 
they're just not going to get it done. You can tell Jason Tatum, he admitted after the game, he was limping after the game. That was a pretty severe ankle sprain that he had. Uh, I mean, even in the still shot, his ankle bent, you know, all the way. And he gutted out. He played through it. Um, I'm not going to say that's an excuse. Uh, and I'm not going to give him an out, give the Celtics an out. But he clearly wasn't as mobile as he was. But overall, either way it goes, I think Miami showed that they're the better team. They might not have the most talent on paper, especially with no Tyler Hero, no Victor Oladipo in this entire series. But they're the better team. They're more cohesive. Caleb Martin, shout out to him. I mean, it's the most points for an undrafted player in, a, in conference finals history. And the Heat played seven undrafted players in the rotation in these postseason. That's the first ever team to make the, make the finals playing seven undrafted players in their rotation. So uh, the Heat have been through a lot this entire season. Uh, they're the first playing team ever to make, to make it to the NBA finals. I think we have to give them their credit. I, I do. And I, I, the story about J. Cole and Caleb Martin, I just every time I hear it, I sort of chuckle like that's an in insane story. Um, maybe it's recency bias, but what we watched Caleb Martin do last night was pretty special. Yeah, he did. He saved the heat. So uh, you owe him something. But Chandler, if they would have called out Caleb Martin's name last night for the Eastern Conference Finals MVP, would you have been shocked? I would have been shocked just because Jimmy Butler is their best player. He's been their best player all season long and this entire series. So I would have been shocked. But you, you look at Caleb Martin. This kid is a he, he can play and he's long and he can defend. And now he's knocking down shots. He's getting to his spots. You look at the side by side of him and Jalen Brown. We're going to talk about getting a super max contract. Mm -hmm. This Caleb Martin averages 19.3 points per game this series. Jalen Brown, 19. 6.4 rebounds for Caleb Barton. 6.1 for, for Jalen. 60% from the field, 49% from three, and 88 from free throw to compared to 42, 16, and 67 from Jalen Brown. So we're talking about a guy that's really about to get a huge contract who's deserving, but he showed up and he played. And it's tough for the Celtics to win. This I think still the best duo in the NBA. But when you got Tatum going five for 13 with 14 points, and you got Jalen Brown going eight for 23 with a career high eight turnovers and the biggest game in a game seven with everything on the line, that's tough. So it's it's hard to point the finger to anybody else other than those two guys because they're the best players, right? They get all the praise when they win and they get the negative media when they lose. And that's just part of the game. But these two are great players. They had a great season, but they just came up short. And I respect the way they fought. I respect the way they came back. But the hole they dug in that first quarter last night, like Sean said, they went to the zone. They were just hoisting threes, and they were getting good looks. They just didn't knock the shots down, This was, which resulted to long rebounds and allowed the Heat to get out and not let the Celtics set their defense. But this, this was... Again, I did not see this coming, man. This was this was not close. This was a double-digit lead from the very, very beginning, and the Heat deserved it. It was, uh, I think, before the game, people, were, maybe it was just me saying this, but I was like, I don't want to see another blowout because games uh, four and five were not fun. But then I thought if I if there was a blowout, I want it to be Miami because I think Miami is just more fun to watch, <laughs> and maybe that's just me saying that. But there's going to be a lot of talk right now about the Celtics' loss, uh, the body language, these ideas that these guys don't like each other. Jalen Brown, after the game, is already sort of him and hawing and doesn't really want to answer questions. Um, if we're going to put blame, and we're going to start today, who are we blaming for the Celtics, Chandler? <laughs> Uh, I'm again. I'm, I'm blaming the best two players that didn't show up in Game oh, Seven. Both. You're not picking one. You're not gonna pick one. <laughs> well, again, <laughs> it's, it's tough because the, this team is kind of organized around these two. Everything goes through these two. Uh, Missoula, I will say, he does have some blame. I think it's 50-50 if they keep him after this. I think obviously they just signed him to the mm. four-year deal. If they were to get swept, I think he would have been gone. Uh, but the way they fought back, I think he's still going to stay in there. But th this is a collective effort, man. You don't get this far and you don't get to the conference finals w without it being some sort of a successful year. But when you have the talent they have, when you have that duo, when you have those championship aspirations like they did, this is a failure. Jalen Brown said that after the game. He failed. They failed. They let the city down, the whole organization down. Um and again, just Jason Tatum, it's not an excuse, but that ankle injury, the first play of the game, I mean, it's hard to think this game wouldn't have went another way if that didn't happen, but that's that's basketball and that's part of it. And I, I do think he would have had a bigger game without that because he was definitely hobbled uh, for the re remainder of the game. But it, it's, it's tough not to sit here and blame Jason Tatum 
Jalen Brown, uh, Missoula, he definitely looked lost at some moments and showed his inexperience, but they lost this as a team, and, and no doubt they'll be back, though. To me, this is an organizational failure. There's plenty of blame to, to spread around. I think that's a, a failure of their philosophy on offense. I think it's a failure of a lot of things. They, they shot more threes than twos again last night, and they shot 9 of 42 from that range. They, they shot 21%. If, if you look at Jalen Brown, uh, Marcus Smart, and Derek White, they shot 4 of 24 from three combined. You look at the, the play where Jason Tatum got hurt, Al Horford had a layup on Gabe Vincent, passed out of it with three seconds to go on a shot clock, and then you get your best player hurt because you don't want to just take a layup. It's a frustrating team to watch, and they talked all year long about shot profile, about math, about just out-mathing everybody. You, you, you can't <laughs> out-math the playoffs. It doesn't work like that. You have to play basketball. You have to make tough shots. You have to get to the rim. You got to rebound. You got to defend, which is something else they didn't do. This idea that you can just three-point everybody to death, it's its never been proven true. It, it probably will never be proven true because the playoffs are different than the regular season. We don't play these games on a spreadsheet. It's frustrating watching that team play the way they do. And when you leave everything up to variance of your shot making, this is what happens. You lose the biggest game of the season because your variance goes one way and you wanted it to go the other way. It's it's uh, it's disappointing. I don't think you need to break up the band. I just think you need to approach the game a little bit different, especially in the playoffs. And yes, Jason getting hurt changed everything. But Jason got hurt on one of those plays that I hate to see when somebody passes out of a wide open layup because they think they're going to get a corner three. So I blame that. <laughs> All right, that's uh, I think that's well thought out and, and a fair blame. Um, a lot of people might even start to blame Joe Missoula. Look, he was on his way to being swept out of this thing and managed to come back and make a game seven out of it. Did that save his job, Shams? Well, I think you, you look at Jason Tatum's comments after the game, the fact that he vouched for Joe Missoula, I think that was of, of no. But I think the, the impression that I'm getting right now is the Celtics and Missoula will look more toward stacking and elevating his bench with more veteran assistance, uh, they, they need some depth on that staff. I think they're going to look more toward that this offseason. There, there definitely was momentum built uh, in this series. You win three in a row, make this a series where you go into game seven at home, a uh, chance to make history. And I think everything that went into this, Joe Mazzolo didn't find out that he was going to be head coach until literally a day or two before media day <laughs> when all the Ime Udoka stuff happened. So there is some, some something to be said there as far as having a full offseason season. Uh, to, to have to your own and, and really build the right way. And the bottom line also is that Joe Mazzola is about $14 million from what I'm told on his deal for the, for the three years after this. So they just signed to that new deal. Um, and I, I think just given how this year went, yes, if he got swept, I think there would be a lot more questions. But the fact that it did go to Game 7, um, I, I think it allowed the Celtics to see that there is a little bit of runway, some potential here. Yeah, this guy, he got thrown into the fire. And again, this is a great team to inherit everything that he got with the, this roster and, and the season they had before. This is a great job to have. And and there were up and downs for him. And I do think he should be able to come back. And I do think they should keep this duo together and fully in Jalen Brown. Um, we, we, I feel like Derek White hasn't really been talked about enough. This guy is so important. We got an argument last night watching the game, how we think he's better than the Jordan Pools and the Tyler Heroes just because he Woo! does more uh, as a basketball player. He's not might not be more talented. He might not have better handles or last year game, but Derek White can hoop and he impacts winning and he plays hard. He's the type of guy that they do need. Uh, they do need a deeper bench. Uh, I, it hurts me to watch Robert Williams run up and down the floor. I feel like he's in pain. His knees uh, are, are not good. But I think this team, this is going to hurt, and this is going to sting, which I think long-term is going to help this team. And I do think they'll be back right in this position next year, kind of like Jimmy said. I think next year the Celtics will be right back in position. Pay Jalen Brown his money. He deserves it. You're not getting anyone better than him. You have an absolute star in Tatum. And get more guys like Derek White to surround those guys on a deeper bench, and I think they'll be just fine. Yeah, but you know what, Chandler, when you say that, like if, if they were to come out and say the same things the way Jimmy Butler does, it doesn't have the same sort of gravitas when Jimmy Butler, like when Jimmy Butler says it, I, I believe it for some reason. The Celtics don't feel like that to me, but you're right. They do have this opportunity now. Are they going to give the Supermax to Jalen Brown so much monies? Uh, Eddie, if you're the Celtics, what are you doing? 
you pay him. He's 26 years old. He just made second team All NBA. I know you had a rough series. You don't break up your franchise for a rough series when you look at the success you've had over the last five years. You you, you pay him. You you sign the wing who can defend. Yes, he has a little, some holes on offense, and, and yes, he could have shot better in this series. And and yeah, it's funny to watch his handle be a little loose. But you pay him, because like Chandler said, you, you you don't have a better option. People are talking about trading for Damian Lillard. People are talking about mm. uh, trading him for just pieces and depth. No, you, you, you lock up the All-NBA wing, who has yet to even turn 27 years old, and you pair him with your other All-NBA wing, and you move on, and you see what happens from there. How many rosters have we looked at and said, hey, if they had kept this team together, look what that would have been. And we look at these pictures of... Brandon Ingram and, and Julius Randle and Lonzo Ball and go, oh, what that team could have been. And, and then we go back to the Thunder, of course, with KD and, and Russ and James Harden. Now you keep them together and then you figure out the rest around them. You had a first year coach who was thrust into that position a week before the season started. A lot of growing pains there. They, they desperately need a point guard. I agree with Shams there, somebody to help get them in line and, and run that offense. But you keep those two together. If anything, if you feel like you need to trade him later, you trade him later when you have his five-year contract and he's a little more enticing that way. But it, it, you don't even think about this. You pay him, you make it work. Yeah. Yeah, I, I fully agree. They <laughs> in their goddamn mind if they didn't re-sign this kid. He can do it all. He can defend. He can score. He can rebound. Uh, there's no better option. Like I just said, what they're going to trade for an older Damian Lillard to try and win now. Like, no, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum are there now. They are the future. They are their everything. You have to lock in this dude. And then again, it's what else they do. It's can they find another another Derek White? Can they find a more solid bench? Uh, you know, they had guys like Gallinari and Blake Griffin that didn't really pan out and didn't really give them the minutes that they need. But they need guys like that that can actually contribute, that can help uh, that can relieve some pressure when when guys do go down and the season's long. There's always going to be injuries. They have to they have to get deeper. Um, but Jalen Brown, he's he's a he's a top ten, top fifteen player in the NBA. You you do whatever you can to resign him. Hey, top fifteen, Shams. Oof. Does he want to stay? By the way, I mean, I, I get it. The money. I, 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 let's just pretend like that's not a thing. But three hundred million dollars, I, I would stay anywhere. I'd stay with my worst enemies twenty four seven. But. It does, like, I wonder if he wants to stay or if he would rather be somewhere else. It's hard to tell sometimes from his body language. Shams, I know you have news for us. We love to celebrate people getting new gigs here at Run It Back. Talk to me. Milwaukee first. Yeah, Adrian Griffin, new head coach of the Milwaukee Bucks. They went through a finalist process of Nick Nurse, Adrian Griffin, Kenny Atkinson. And interestingly, they all met one-on-one -on -one with Giannis and did Kumpo before any hiring was made. And then ownership, Giannis, uh, John Horst, their general manager in Milwaukee, they all huddled up afterward to figure out exactly who the coach would be. But the fact that Giannis was so involved in the process, uh, a couple years out from his player option, I think is, is very noticeable. But from what I'm told, Giannis was pretty vehemently against any other candidate besides Adrian Griffin. He, did, he, he really vouched and advocated for Griffin to get the job. And I think when you look at the factors, former player, the, the ability to be relatable, accountable, the defensive structure that I think Adrian Griffin, they believe he's going to bring to the table, what he's been a part of. He's been on so many staffs, Scott Skiles, Billy Donovan, um, the last five years or so with Nick Nurse. And so I think the fact that Giannis wanted him so much, you have to take his voice strongly into account. Yeah, this guy's he's, this guy's been around. He's well respected. Um, he deserves a head coach. You've heard his name throughout the years, kind of get an opportunity, and I'm happy for him. I spent a little bit of time with him in the summer, and he's great X's and O's. He's great player development. He's a great workout guy. Um, and being on those staffs, I've obviously prepared him for this moment. And and Sham said it, the Bucks, they asked their best player. They asked their everything. And with the player option coming up, they wanted to make sure that he was happy. And this seemed to be that his his pick and his guy. So. It makes sense. I, I, I didn't see his name as much as, as like a front runner for this job. So it was a little surprising when I saw it. But from what I know, everything I heard about this guy on the court, off the court, great dude, great coach and a great hire for Milwaukee. Yeah, I, I think them giving the one on one with Giannis is fascinating. And, and like <laughs> Sam said, his player options coming up and you 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 have to listen to Giannis in this situation, but I, I can't recall a time where I've heard that I've heard of players being involved in the meetings with 
a one-on-one -on -one dinner with with the with the MVP and, and, and all that. That's that's fascinating, and it, it signals that how important he is to the future of this franchise and how much they need to keep him. And 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 that's not breaking news, but. Yeah, them giving him the keys like that and essentially letting him pick the coach by by Sam's reports, it's uh it's it's interesting to see. Uh you gotta remember this is the guy who jumped in front of the Jason Kidd firing as well. So I don't know that players are always the best options to pick the coach, but it's it means a lot for the franchise to hand that decision over to Giannis and, and we'll see we'll see where it goes. I think he's a great candidate. I think I love to see guys like this getting their shot and the benches he's been a part of. And, you know, his time in the league and all the things he's seen in basketball, uh, I, I, I want to see how he does out here. But you, you, the signs point to him at least having a, a good uh, idea of what he wants to do going forward. I know, but were these candidates allowed to ask Giannis what his intentions are after two seasons <laughs> if he's planning on staying? Because I feel like that would also yeah. affect whether or not I wanted to be the coach of this team. But he doesn't sure. have to be honest. Uh, we're taking a quick break. Coming up later in the show, the idea is the league is considering free throws for flopping. Good idea or not. But before that, Jock Landell, Phoenix Sun Center is standing by. Yes, we're going to get the scoop on everything. We want to hear what he thought about this game seven. And well, former Spurs are always welcome here. When Run It Back returns. Run it back, run it up, and run it back, run it up. It's game time. Landale, the dunk. Jock Landale finishes it off. Landale, an and one. Oh, he's doing it all right now. It's fun to watch yourself on a loop. Joining us today, Jock Landell for the Phoenix <laughs> Suns Center. And I was going to get right into Game 7, Jock. And thank you. I know it's early out on the West Coast. But before we came back, you were telling us about your day and why you're stuck in Los Angeles. And I would love for you to share this story. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we we took a little trip um, right after season. And, and we, we went out to dinner. And we were kind of at dinner discussing the possibility of, of going to Europe and um, just spending a week out there because we've got some stuff on out there next year that we needed to kind of check in on. We came back from dinner and the dog was sitting there and my passport was just spread out across the room. So the dog definitely had other plans in that regard. So right now we're doing a little trip out to San, uh, San Francisco to get a new passport, which has oh. just been a pain in the ass. So that's that. <laughs> to expedite a passport. And it's a golden retriever for anybody who's wondering if you're in the market for a dog. I don't know if that sells yep. you on a golden retriever or sways you away from he's a golden retriever. He's on sale for cheap right now, so just- he's uh, on sale. <laughs> Poor little guy, just didn't want you to leave. All right, so <laughs> I know we got basketball to talk to and we had the uh, the improbable happen this past week. We got a game seven out of what seemed like a, a very easy sweep for the Miami Heat. What were your reactions as a player watching a, a team like Boston come back from something like that? I mean, it, it, like well, when they when they came out and said don't let us get one I, I really like believe that because momentum as you know in the NBA is is a crazy thing and and once a team gets going just like Miami had it going in the first three it's it's really hard to slow them down and stop them so I felt watching watching that series unfold that Boston did a great job of kind of getting the momentum swing back on their side and I I thought that it was going to be tough to um, to slow them down but every win that they had I was you know, it was without Gabe Vincent, Vincent, who was a huge piece of the puzzle for them. And then, you know, Jimmy had a couple off nights, Bam had a couple off nights, and, and their role players kept kind of ticking along. So I felt as though the whole time, if they could just get their, the whole thing to kind of click and come together, then then that fourth win was going to be a no-brainer. And it took them until game seven, but, you know, I, I, feel, I really feel as though their, their bench and their role players stepped up in a huge way and... Um, all those undrafted guys, as people like to keep calling them, uh, they, they were huge. And Caleb Martin was massive for them last night and being able to kind of help them get across the line. But I felt, felt as though last night was kind of the complete picture for Miami and, and they did a great job of just banding together and, and, and doing what it took to, you know, win at the right time. So, Jock, the Heat are now going to face the Nuggets, who beat your sons in the West Semis. Um, do you think that he can do this? Can they really pull this off and win? And do you think there's anyone there that can really contain or stop Nikola Jokic? I just don't believe you can stop Jokic um, playing against him and, and, you know, trying to push him to the brink of, of, you know, fatigue and just slow him down as much as possible by working him, you know, uh, up and down the court nonstop and crashing every board. He really is able to just 
take his foot off the gas from from an intensity standpoint, but still be able to pick apart uh, the defense. So I don't necessarily believe that they're going to be able to stop Yoke. Um, I think it's more about can you stop the players around him from from being massive contributing factors? Can you hold Jamal to 15 to 20 rather than giving him 30 a night? Um, I think that there are some huge players uh, that Bruce Brown makes on a, on a regular basis. Can you kind of cut those out? Um, and then I think their secondary unit, can you do a great job of kind of um, hurting them? I think that's where, where, where you can really win games. It's, it's, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough matchup for any team. Um, in saying that Bam, Bam is a really great defensive player. Who's a nice kind of um, mixture of an all-star, but who also gives an incredible effort every single night. And I think that that, is a rare combination that maybe he hasn't seen uh, yet in the playoffs. So um, it's going to be it's going to be inter- it's going to be an interesting one. Um, I, I believe that it's, that Miami. I was thinking about last night. I think that they can really push them in this series and, and 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 surprise a lot of people. The other thing is is there's been this constant narrative around Miami of being the underdogs, and and I believe that that's where Boston might have lost a few games at the start was they took their foot off the gas thinking, oh, this is just, this, this is an eight seed. We, we can, you know, come in and get this done um, with our eyes closed. And, and obviously that didn't happen. So it, I think this is going to be a series. I don't think it's going to be a walk in the park like some people might believe it's going to be. Um, Miami's tough. They make great adjustments. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure who's, who Dem is going to defend them with. Um, so I feel as though this is going to be a tough matchup for both teams. Big fella, you 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 got a lot of praise for the job you did on Nikola Jokic in your guys' series, and you had some great minutes in that series. What's it like guarding Jokic? I mean, this is a guy who can do literally everything on the court at that size. <laughs> Give us an idea of what it's like to just have to deal with that matchup in a playoff series. It's tough, man. It is really tough. Um, I have I have a few plays in the back of my head where, you know, I defend him as well as I can, and he just has this feathery touch, which is damn near impossible to stop so um i wasn't really too concerned with with whether or not he had 53 on a given night or if i held him to you know 20 17 and 18 and and it was funny and in that series some people were saying oh you know i got the best of him on any given night and then i look at the the box score and guys got 27 18 and 16 it's like well it's kind of tough to see it that way from my position but my whole mindset was just like slow him down as much as possible by by giving a by giving a great effort every single possession and just working myself to exhaustion because I kind of know where my limit will be. But seeing if I can bring him to that just a little bit quicker, given the minute, you know, uh, discrepancy and everything that we, we were playing. So I knew that I was going to get 20 to 25 minutes um, in, in games three and four, and then I was going to just take it from there. But I wasn't really too concerned with whether or not he made buckets and, and, and did what he does because he's a two-time MVP for a reason. All I was concerned with was crash the glass every single time and just kind of run through run through him as much as possible and then up and down the court as, as much as possible. And then on top of that, it was like, you know, making sure that I wasn't doing, you know, the NBA thing where you just kind of walk into a non-ball. It was sprint down to the baseline, make him touch the baseline with me and then come flying back up and into an on-ball at half court. And I was just trying to really wear him down as much as possible so that, you know, we could, I never thought we were going to stop him on the offensive end, but could we get more production out of our guys offensively uh, with him being tired on the defensive end? So that's where my, my mind was at the whole time. Um, I had the luxury of kind of sitting back and watching those games one and two unfold um, courtside. So uh, it was, I feel as, I felt as though I had like a good <laughs> idea what I had to do. So, yeah. Yeah, Jock, keeping it with the big fellas, uh, DeAndre Ayton, he's got a lot of criticism all season long, especially in the postseason. And, and you defended him. You said, you know, I'm tired of people shitting on him, basically. Uh <laughs> <laughs> what uh what what did his critics not see that you as his teammate as his boy see every single day in the facility in the locker room yeah i mean da to me is someone who who copped the brunt of criticism ever since um obviously i wasn't on the team last year but ever since they lost to uh to dallas last year in game seven and when i came into the facility there was a lot of there was a lot of negativity being kind of slung towards him and 
I got to really know the guy over a year and I thought that he was a great teammate. Um, every single time that I was out there competing, he was the first one up the, off the bench to kind of, you know, clap and come talk to me. And um, he was always kind of in my ear about what to do next. And and then that, that trickled over just into the locker room and then into the practice facility. And then it was, you know, we were hanging out off the court as well. And I just kind of got fed up with, with, hearing about how this guy was, you know, took took me in from the start of the year and I saw him kind of always being up and about and clapping for his teammates. And I know that these are little things, but um and, and and I know that there is a side to, you know, we're basketball players and we need to perform on the court, but there was just so much more that he was he was doing well that people weren't necessarily recognizing. And me being from Australia, me being from a culture that kind of, you know, claps and emphasizes um you know, the teammate aspect of everything. I thought that that was something that was being overlooked completely. The other thing was we were in the middle of a playoff battle and it was obvious that all this chat and, and talk was getting to him. So I was like, someone's got to step up here and let him know that he's not just in this by himself and he's not just, you know, like I'm not cool with how people were talking about him uh, being one of my boys. So all I did was just kind of be who I was and, and, and said, you know, enough's enough. And, and this guy deserves to know that, you know, we've we got him, we got his back and, and, and that he's not in this thing alone. So um, there's a lot of things that DA does well, you know, even on the court, even though he wasn't having the best series, like we all understood that. And I think he understood that um, he had a great year and, and he was a huge piece of the puzzle for us early on in the season and through the whole, the whole regular season, he had a, he had a good series against, um, against the Clippers, but he was fine on his feet. And, you know, we went through a huge transition during all star break and he was, he was, um, he, his role changed drastically. So I feel, I felt like he needed to hear that from someone within the organization. I know that Monty was, was, was trying to be in his ear about it, but I thought one of us players needed to step up and just let him know uh, publicly that, that we had his back. You mentioned coach Monty and he obviously was fired shortly after the series. Uh, how, how did you feel about that situation? You know, were you surprised? Uh, did, did you, were you hoping he'd stay on? What, what was your vantage point with that? Yeah. I mean, I, I love playing for Monty. Um, you know, those decisions are obviously well out of my control, but um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed playing for Monty. I, I, he, I mean, he gave me my first real NBA opportunity ever, and I'm, I'm going to be forever grateful for that. Um, someone that, that I thought did a really good job within his role of, of kind of managing our team and, and, and helping us through the season, despite, you know, there was, despite all the criticism that was around us, despite all the changes that we went through, um, roster and organization base, um, I thought Monty did a, did a hell of a job. So, um, you know, I, I can't really speak on the, the, the decision that was made because that's well above my pay grade. And um, <laughs> I, all I can say is that, like, I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of what Monty did for me and, and, you know, enjoyed my time with him throughout the year and, and kind of navigating a pretty rough terrain for the most part. Jock, what type of coach do you think would be best suited for you guys moving forward? What characteristics would you look at? Yeah, I think that uh, I think that a coach that can really manage our, our locker room is is huge and necessary. And I think that someone who can kind of piece together a championship winning team, who's probably you know done it in the past, um, would be would be great for us. Because at this point, it really feels as though the the Phoenix Suns is you know we're going for it all, and, and we need to get across the line at some point. So. I think that the only question that really needs to be asked is who's best suited to be able to help us do that. And I mean, that's where I sit on, on that fact, on that matter is, is, you know, we need to win a championship. We, we all want to win a championship we're here to win a championship. So how can we, how can we best, you know, pick a head coach to help us do that? Um, obviously there's, there, there's, I think there's three names on the, on the card right now. I don't, I'm not entirely sure, but, um, yeah, I think that I think that there's some great options there for us um, in going forward, and, and we've got to wait and see what happens. Yeah, you and your former teammate Mikael Bridges uh, have a hilarious, very interesting uh, relationship online. Uh, have one of you posted anything that you thought might have crossed the line at all, or is this all in good fun? 
No, nah, never. I, th I think <laughs> I think people really uh, look. I need to take it a step further from where I sit. I need to really start outing some of his his personal life and and, yes. and just letting him know to cool it a little bit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no. Nah, I think that some of the some of the uh, some of the people on Twitter took that last one a little bit to heart and uh, really start. Even some of the Phoenix Suns fan. I had to text him after. I was like, man, I don't even think I can go at you anymore because these Phoenix Suns fans, even when you're gone, they jump on your side instead of mine. So uh, I think Mikhail's a little bit of a protected species, and I've got to I've got to cool it just a little bit, just a little bit. Yeah, there's no font in Twitter for sarcasm. Unfortunately, people still don't get no. it after how many years the thing's been out there. But um, obviously, I'm going to ask about Pop. Rookie season, San Antonio, under Popovich. Um, did you, what did you learn? Are there any stories you can share? Uh, man, I, le I learned a lot. Um, first <laughs> off, it was, it was pretty cool to be a part of the um, – the 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 winning record uh that that was a really sick experience to be able to kind of play a part and a, a very very small part in uh in that i think we only won like 23 games or something but um we got we got across the line so that was good um but yeah no, that, was, that was a really cool part um of of my career was being able to see see that unfold and um in terms of stories, I haven't got too many for you that kind of top the ones that I've heard out there. But, you know, in terms of what I learned, it was just it was about managing the NBA space. Um, I will say that like my first my first week in the facility, he came to me and I kind of sit back on it now. And I'm like, I was probably sarcastic, but he he came to me the first practice and he was like, right, I want you to do like a five minute presentation on the Joe Biden infrastructure bill that's about to be passed for like $3 trillion. And I was like, is this, is this guy serious? Like, I don't even know if he's serious. So I went home and like in my notebook, like writing down this full speech about it. And I was like, all right, I'm ready to go. And then like a week passed, I didn't say anything, a week passed and I was like, Pop, like I got this speech written down. Like I put some serious time into this. You want me to make this speech? But what's going on? And he was like, oh, I was being sarcastic. But now that, you're, now that I know that, you are for sure telling us about this. So... <laughs> I had to get up in front of the whole group and like read it out of this notepad, and I was just like, "God damn!" Like I definitely could have dodged that. But, yes, um, this is awesome. Yeah, that, that was that was a good pop one. Uh, but yeah, he he just he taught me a lot about the perspective on 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 life outside of basketball and and making sure that you know we don't just get too obsessed and too involved in this and and have some perspective on the world going on around us. And I think you see that day in and day out with his with his efforts outside uh, in the community and what he's kind of doing for America right now. I was about to say Texas, but he's really doing a lot for America. So, um, yeah, he's he's a pretty incredible man and to be doing what he's doing now. And um, I don't think Pop's going to retire anytime soon with their number one draft pick coming in. So uh, yeah. I think we'll be around <laughs> for a long time. Woohoo! <laughs> Jock, you really established yourself as an NBA player this year, of course, as, whether it's starting, coming off the bench. Um, I think you've proven that. But now you look into it, you're going to be a restricted free agent this offseason. Are you hoping to go back to the Suns? What's your outlook when you go into free agency this summer as a guy that's going to be sought after? Yeah, um, I, would, I would love to go back to the Suns. We, we really enjoyed the city. We really enjoyed the fan base, the organization, the basketball um, we, we bought a house there because we loved it so much and we, we thought this could be a home for us long term. Um, I do understand, however, that it's that it's a business and, and that, you know, um, there's a lot to go through and a few hoops to go through in terms of, you know, what, what can take care of our family. So I'm not totally set on Phoenix and nothing else, but but I definitely want to return there. Um, had a phenomenal year there and uh, we, we just enjoy the the culture and the lifestyle in Phoenix and, and then the organization's great. You know, the teammates there love playing with CP, Book, KD. Um, you know, th these are all guys that I really enjoy playing with and would like to do so for a long time, but it's a business. And at, at some point, you know, being 27, I really have to look at it as such and, and make sure that I'm taken care of long-term and going forward. So, um, yeah, there's there's a lot to happen. It's exciting times, but um, but yeah, you know, if, if we can figure out a way to get it done with Phoenix, I would I would love to stay there. Jock, you went undrafted 2018 draft. 
Are you one of those guys who has the list in your head of all the big fellas who went drafted before you? Do you got like smoke for Mo Wagner every time you see him? Is that in there for you? <laughs> no, nah, I mean, I, I don't even, I don't even think I was undrafted. I tell everyone I was the 61st pick in the 2018 draft. So I don't even look at it like that. But um, yeah, I definitely, I, I wouldn't say I have a list as such. Uh, but I definitely have a little bit of chip on my shoulder and I feel as though given what I had to go through to get back into the NBA and all the hard days that I had to do out in Europe by myself and stuff, there's, it, it really changed who I was as a person and, and, and taught me to kind of never take my foot off the gas and, and make sure that I'm always in the gym and there's, and knowing that there's someone behind me who's always, you know, he's always trying to get out in front. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely not one of those guys who has a list, but there there are certain people that I look forward to playing and, and making sure that, you know, I can prove a point against them because I know that that helps me long term. So, um, yeah, it's it was a long road to get here and, and, and I'm really pumped to be here and, you know, have, you know, done a job this 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 uh, this postseason to be able to solidify myself a little bit. But um yeah, I attribute a lot of that to to kind of what I had to go through for those three years and two years in Europe and then year back home in Australia to to be able to get here. And um, yeah, it's pretty cool to think about. Pretty cool to think about. Jock, we, we appreciate the time early in the morning. And I know you have a really fun day ahead of you to get your passport. Um, <laughs> what do you call your haircut before we let you go? What do you call it? Sexy? I don't know. Nice. That's I all know. I was looking for, Jock. That's all I was looking for. <laughs> Thank you so much, so much. Uh, have a great off season. We'll see you next season. Shams, we'll see you tomorrow, so uh, don't go too far. And uh, when we come back, it's Chandler, it's Eddie, it's me. We're probably going to change your life when Run It Back returns. Run It Back. We are back. Time for some You Buying That. There it is, Shams with the NBA's Competition Committee discussing this idea of uh, rewarding, or not rewarding, I should say. If you flop, technical free throw. There we go. Chandler, do you love this? And we may get to see it in Summer League, which is kind of exciting. I do. I absolutely love this. I think it eliminates it. I think it's kind of like a take foul where flopping has now become such a huge part of the game where it, it stops momentum. It stops runs. I think I think referees should be should be, you know, docked if, if they bite it, if then if they fall for a flopping. With, with all the reviews, with all the cameras. Um, this, like I said, this just this changes the momentum of the game, and it shouldn't be part of the game. So I love it. I love the idea of trying it in summer league and, and yes. seeing, seeing if it works and whatnot. But yeah, there's there's no there's no you can't you can't play physical and flop in the same game. It doesn't make sense. So I love the idea of kind of finally putting an end to this and making it actually your team. Uh, well, who decides flop. what a flop is, though? I guess that's the question, right, Eddie? Like, how, yeah. how are you determining a flop? Other yeah, that's obvious. the issue. And if it, <laughs> that's the issue. And if you're somebody like Kyle Lowry, you have your reputation, mm. you're not going to get the benefit of the doubt ever. <laughs> I, I do want to say real quick before I agree with Chandler, because I absolutely agree. I think the penalty should be maybe even stiffer than that. Like but That LeBron play, LeBron got hit in the <laughs> face and he got pushed. That's not a flop to me. Some of those what? other ones are flops. But what I will say is, like, yo, give them a foul, too. Like, add to their foul tally. Could you imagine the first time Marcus Smart gets ejected for having two <laughs> technical fouls off of flops or Joel Embiid? I love this. Like, please get this out the game one way or the other. I'm with you, Michelle, though. I am a little skeptical of, like, yo, it's just left up to the ref's discretion. But always err on the side of, of flopping, please. Like, just, just do it. Because the more we do it, the more stringent we are on it, the less will reward Kyle Lowry, who flopped onto the scores table a few games ago. Like, we have to get rid of this, please. I mean, first of all, reviewing it's going to be funny, too, because it is still all very subjective. But that LeBron play, he was practically in his car, Eddie. What do you mean it wasn't a flop? That is a large if, man if who Nikola flew Jokic, an extra 10 feet. <laughs> if Nikola Jokic hit me in the face, I would have probably been in the fifth row, and I would have sued. <laughs> This is crazy. And I would have sued. Yeah, the, the problem is, the problem is when there's flopping, there is some sort of contact, right? So how do yeah. you justify yeah, what yeah, is yeah. real, what is not? And these guys have gotten pretty good at it. They're gonna learn how to flop better if this becomes a rule where they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna great. create the contact or they're gonna initiate the contact and then they're gonna not sell it as much. But 
So there, there's always going to be a gray area. I do like the idea of making it a foul on them, kind of like when you, when a three point yeah. shooter shoots the three and kicks his leg out or tries to jump into an, a defensive player. That's that's an offensive foul. Flopping should be too, and that should hurt you playing in that game tonight. And not just one free throw. I think it should be more severe. Dang. Okay, I like Let's that. Let's do it. Um, there was some wait. news about Nick Nurse over the weekend. I think a lot of us were had our guesses on which job he would take. It seemed like he had his choice, and it looks like he picked Philly over Phoenix. Huh. You buying that, Chandler? Yeah, it's just interesting because all the James Harden reports, right, about what his, his future there is unsure. But um, then I heard it's it's basically James just said, it's either me or Doc. So this uh, this honestly makes sense. This guy's a likable guy. Uh, I th I'm pretty sure Nick Nurse was in Houston when, when I was there with James. There's a relationship there that we don't know about. Um, <laughs> this is... This is hilarious here, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like it. it's tough because obviously the, the Suns, they have a win now roster right now as well. And that's a job. That's a great city and they have a new ownership. So it's something that this guy could have kind of learned with, with, with Ishbia and kind of went with him and been his guy, but Philly's going to be right there again next year. And they have the MVP and they have James Harden who now should be coming back. Who's also a win now. And they have Tyrese Maxis. So they have pieces to be a contender right away. Both of them are great jobs. So I don't knock him for it, but it's definitely interesting because the Suns are, are also right there. Surprise. Yeah, if you know anything about Nick, if you know anything about Nick nurses coaching Odyssey, I mean, he's been everywhere. He's learned the game so many different places. And like Chandler mentioned, yeah, he was he was with the Rockets uh, D-League team at, at the time. Uh, and, and so maybe there is a relationship there. I am a little surprised he chose, seemingly chose this job over the Phoenix job. Uh, just off cities alone. Like, I, like let's go I live thought. in Scottsdale. Like, it's just warm weather. <laughs> but, uh, you know, everything we know of him as a basketball mind, clearly he's seen something he likes there in Philly with – Obviously, with Joel Embiid, the MVP, and then whatever they can add to their roster going forward, uh, it's going to be interesting going forward. But yeah, it's by all mm. accounts, seems like he made his choice, and uh, we'll be excited to see where he goes. By the way, what a about position, retirement? What's what a that? position to be in, by the way. You get the, oh. one of the best teams in the East or one of the best teams in the West, both awesome cities. Man, good for Nick Nurse. It's really good timing uh, in changing jobs as a head coach because that doesn't always work. Sometimes there's nothing left. Um, yeah, no, I was a little bit shocked. And as an old person, I kept thinking, pick the warm weather city. So clearly I have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, quick break time. We will come back. And when we come back, Chandler is going to tell us some of his deepest, back, darkest run secrets up, when Run It Back, back returns. Back, run it <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that? That's not on the show. <laughs> When NBA playoff games tip off, there's no better place to bet than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because now you can build a same game parlay after the game has already started. Live SGPs are just one of the new features added for the playoffs. So go check it all out right now on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. And yes, we've got a little bit of time before game one tips off on Thursday. The Nuggets, huge heavy favorites to win the title, minus 480 according to the FanDuel Sportsbook. Um, I know the Heat have been not believed in, but are you reluctant again, Chandler, to bet against the Heat, or do you like these odds? They're, they're high odds. They are crazy, they are. crazy. Odds. The, the Heat, I, I've been going against them pretty much all playoff long, and then they keep proving me wrong. Um, it's an interesting matchup because they're kind of two different styles. The one loves to play defense and slow it down. One loves offense and plays fast. So it's the, the styles will definitely mesh and definitely going to be a, a great series, but I would take the nuggets. I think the nuggets win in either five or six, but it's, it's going to be a great series. <laughs> yeah. I'm with Chandler. I mean, I, I've been proven wrong with this Miami heat, I think three <laughs> times now. So I mean, let me not be wrong again, but uh, the styles clash is, is the series to me. The the, the Nuggets are going to want to run. They're going to want to get shots up. And the Heat want to play for 23 seconds and then finally get their shot up. And it's going to be that clash. And I think Mike Malone has proven himself to be top-tier NBA coach. And then you have Eric Spolster on the other end. So it's going to be a battle of philosophies. But at the end of the day, you just can't do anything about Jokic. I think it's just his time. It's his year. And apologies to Jimmy Butler, but it's Nikola Jokic's time. I'm just excited. I'm excited for these finals. I'm stoked to watch. And if you've been watching the playoffs at all, you should be too. And tomorrow we will have a complete and total and thorough preview of game one. 
See you guys then. Run it back, yeah. Run it all. Run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it.